Okay, what is it that got you interested in this kind of painting, Tom? I know you've always liked to paint ships for a long time, but you you kind of got off on other kinds of of uh, vessels and then got into this. But it's, it's been kind of an interest for a long time, I guess. I guess when I was uh, about 1936, I think when I was a kid, I was uh, spending the summers in Algonquin, Maine, which is not far from uh, Gloucester. And used to go down there and see Gordon Grant, who was an artist, a friend of my grandmother's. And he was a marine artist and one of the best. And, uh, I happened to see the movie Captain's Courageous when I was down there. And it premiered, I think, in Gloucester. And we saw it there, and I got interested in the subject. And, uh, Started, started pursuing that, uh, finding out more about that, the whole industry. Did Did you meet Gordon Grant? Oh yeah, yeah, I used to know. How him. old a man was he when you when you met him? Oh, he was pretty old. The, um, I met him there, and I also met him when the, when I was in the Navy. I, uh, we pulled into New, he had a studio in New York also, and he was there in the winter time, and and we pulled into. Uh, Put our ship into Pier 42 in New York and I'd go ashore and see him in his studio. He was doing commercial stuff as well as books and marine painting. And uh, he was always a great inspiration to me as a kid. Well, he drew very well, too. That was another thing that the draftsmanship was great. Very... Yeah, a good draftsman. And, uh, he was a great pen and ink artist, you know. Yeah. I guess people would think it'd be, it's a little bit strange for somebody landlocked in the middle of the country to be into, into this kind of marine painting, which is uh, yeah, rather, spe to... rather specialized, uh, but it, like you and I have talked before, that nobody else is really doing anything like this. There are a lot of marine painters that paint, paint, clipper, ships. paint clipper ships and dock scenes and this and that. It's sort of varied. It all has to do with the ocean, but not as uh, to the degree. I don't think they, they get into the study of the of water as much as, of the sea itself, as much as you have. No, I guess that's one. I really like to, to look at water. It sort of fascinates me. I, one reason I like these kind of ships, they're smaller ships and they they really have sort of more of a re intimate relationship with the surrounding environment and clipper ships and all, they're so big that uh, they're, they're almost isolated from the sea. And, uh, well, it's smaller the ship, the more the part of it they become. Well, I know that uh, years back when you know you and I first met, uh, you had the model of the Thebo started. No, that was the Elsie. Or, or the Elsie, okay. Yeah. But how do you, how, what is sort of the evolution of the way uh, these hull, the hull design and this, uh, what caused them to be like what they are? Because they're very beautiful ships and they, uh, obviously the function of them is uh, they had the work and yet they had to have speed. Is that? Well, yeah, they were actually, they were in the fresh fish, fish business and they, uh, originally they used to fish just offshore. And it wasn't very far to bring the fish back to market, but as uh, they had to go further and further to catch fish, they uh, they had two ways of preserving them. They either salted them or they iced them. And uh, if they were going to run the fish back to market fresh, what they call uh, market boats, they would just uh, carry ice and they'd ice them down. Then they'd run them back to market fresh rather than salt them. If they had to stay out a long time and they couldn't get back very fast, they used to salt them down. So uh, when they ran them back fresh, uh, it was uh, speed was very important so fish didn't spoil. And it was always a race to get back to market as soon as possible. Yeah, because it was a commercial, in uh, commercial uh, it was a operation, and they were trying to make money off of it. Did they build these boats uh, as strongly as? They might have, or are they? Were they built just to like the edge of what they had to do? Oh no, they were very, very sturdy vessels. It, uh, 
course, they sail all year long in, in the middle of the winter in the North Atlantic. It's, it's terrible conditions. But they were probably the, the, the epitome of, of shipbuilding. Uh, very efficient, uh, sturdy, and uh, fast. And I think you told me one, t one time that the age of the fishermen, too, was, was quite oh, old. Yeah. I mean, you, did, you saw young men at it, but you also saw a lot of older. You see fellows in their 60s, 65, 70 years old, still fishing every day in the middle of the winter in the North Atlantic. Very, well, it's also a very physical uh, well, kind of a thing. I mean, it's hard work. It's a harsh environment. It's hard work and long work. You, they'd fish all night long when the fish were running, and uh, it was very a tough life. And, uh, this painting that you have uh, in progress here, tell me a little bit about uh, what uh, what you're trying to show in that, or what. Well, what time of what is this time of the year, and what is it? What are they? Uh, that's the painting of the Helen B. Thomas, which was a. The first, what they call knockabout schooner, it was the first one that was built without a bowsprit on it. They uh, used to lose lose a lot of men. It's when they would see when, when they'd go out of the bowsprit to furl the sails. You know, the bowsprit is uh, would normally be from here on out. Right. And it's a spar that would hold the head sails out there, and to take those sails, and men would have to climb out on the bowsprit to take the sails in. Well, in, in, in water, in, in weather like this, where it's really rolling, that bowsprit would go underneath the water, and they'd lose men off of that bowsprit all the time. So they experimented when somebody got the idea that why not just extend the hull out to the same distance, then the guys would be inboard rather than outboard when they're taking in the sails. And this was the first best vessel built like that, and it was, everybody was very skeptical, but it turned out to be a, a milestone in schooner building because uh, it worked. It also was easy to handle in, in, in ports. The, the bowsprit didn't, they used to lose bowsprit by banging into wharfs and things, and this way they, there wasn't that big long spar sticking out. So uh, after the, it, the, the idea caught on, they built, it was the beginning of a whole series of schooners that were built as knockabouts. And uh, many more were built. This was the first one that was built. The small vessel, and uh, she was a very fast sailor. She had a real marked shear. The shear is the, the curve of the vessel. And the sweep of the more or less the deck line. If you look yeah. at the profile of it, yeah. yeah, she had a real marked shear. Sort of unique among fishing schooners. Well, each you in each one of the paintings that you do, you try to to uh, tell a story or or. Pick not a vessel, so much, not, not so much a story, but to what, pick a, ve a vessel and then portray it in, in some kind of a, uh, how would you, how? Well, on this, this one, I'm just interested in making a, an interesting looking picture so that you get the feel. I was interested in painting some interesting water mm -hmm. and uh, there isn't much of a story to tell, it's just a. Well, the water is very, is quite impressive. It, uh, it looks like it's either early spring or into early fall. It could well, be, you know, it could be like weather. Now. Could be going into winter or coming out of winter. Either in, in the winter, they never carry, wouldn't carry top top masts or topsails on there. This is a winter rig. I see. They're four lower sails. They're called heavy weather sails, and they take the light sails off. Those are in the summertime when. The weather is so severe, and they used to carry a lot more canvas. But you, you're talking about heavy weather, heavier uh, weight of sail, no, or just more sail? Heavy. They mean heavy weather sail. Okay. And, uh, they didn't have any. They didn't have any such thing as a lighter set of sails. I mean, they had sail canvas, and that was yeah. That was it. It would. They did carry until it wore out. But in the summertime, they would carry more canvas. And they call it light, light weather sail, light sails light canvas. And, uh, so at this point right now, this would be uh, probably a, into the winter more where they don't carry what they call a top hamper. It's another name for it. All the sails that would be up here. And the topsail up here and a topsail up here and a fisherman's staysail down here and, and another 
balloon jib, uh, a flying jib up, up forward. I think something, uh, to me at least, about these vessels, that the, the beauty of the vessel itself makes the, the, the an, an inherent interest in looking at the paintings because they almost look like racing boats. They were. They were designed by guy, the same guys that designed the yachts at the time. The Manus and Burgess were great yeah. yacht designers. They had, well, they had races that the, the fishing boats participated in. Yeah, they did. And, uh, that got to be an obsession with a lot of them. And in the later years, they, they built fishing schooners just for racing, way beyond the point where they were practical for fishing anymore. And, uh, so they probably, in that respect, they probably built them a little lighter and no, slimmer no. or narrower beamed or, or? No, they just got to be very s sleek and then it was that, it was the last ones were in, the, in 19, oh, 1929, 1930 and uh, there wasn't any excuse to build all sail vessels anymore, all the vessels had power in them, but if they hadn't been for the racing they wouldn't have built anymore, but it got to be a competition between the Canadians and the Americans and uh, so they, the Blue Nose was the one that the Canadians had that beat everybody and the uh, Americans always wanted to beat her so they built the Gertrude L. Tebow and the Mayflower and some of those and they, the requirement was that they had to go fishing, had to be working boats to qualify. So they always, they did go fishing but the most practical fishing boats were by that time were power driven. And, uh, so those Tebows made some fishing trips, and uh, but it wasn't long before they cut the mast down. And, and uh, I have pictures of the T-bow all cut down with. Really? Yeah. Fishing. Yeah. Cut the bowsprit down and put a deck, a wheelhouse over the, the the wheel to protect the guys from the weather. Well, it's kind of an inglorious uh, sort of a look to it. Yeah, but. The racing days were over. Let me the ask you. People came to Chicago for the World's Fair. I don't did it? Did I, no, well, I wasn't up here then. No, oh, you weren't here then. I wasn't here. Did the uh, did these vessels influence uh, the uh, America Cup boats or the the uh, the? Uh, well, it was Lipton, I think, that started the oh, race. The America Cup was the first. Was a it was a schooner, the America. That was, yeah. That was the first. Okay. First, that started the uh, the America Cup races. When you look at these boats, you see the hull, the hulls. If you you know in a model or whatever, you see how much they, in a way, they resemble. I mean, just a, from a first glance, they do kind of resemble the the uh, uh, cup boats uh, to a degree. Oh yeah. Of course, the cup boats are so sophisticated and computer designed and everything else that. But not, the basic. Not then they were, no, no. But I'm saying it now. I mean, if even oh, if you take well. one of the hulls now and look at it compared to to one of the uh, cup boats, they still have a fan, there's a resemblance because these were so well designed as far as for speed and yet to, so to do something. Two things, they had, speed, they had to be fast, they had to have a lot of carrying capacity and they had to be very seaworthy and carry a lot of canvas. So the boats were really, it was a, what is it, form follows function almost. Right, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, they could carry a tremendous amount of sail the size of that mainsail was absolutely gigantic. What are some of the areas? Do you know any of the square, any footage areas on some oh, of those? Yeah, I have to look up the square feet. Now, these booms like this would be oh, 60 to 75 to 80 feet long. Uh -huh. That's a gigantic piece of sail. And the reason they could do that was because they had so many men on board. They had a crew of about 20, 25 men to do all the fishing. When uh, That kind of a sail wouldn't be practical if you didn't didn't have that many men because they they take that sail down on a strong breeze and uh, it's a it's a wild thing flopping around there. Well, but it's because they had a lot of guys, they could handle it. It's also very heavy too. Heavy, yeah, especially when it got wet. But, did they uh, did they treat the canvas with anything, or was it just? No, I don't think they treated it. Well, it's just uh, just canvas. There's been a lot of criticism of this type of vessel. They got sort of carried away with their vessels, and they a lot of people thought that a much more practical design would be a catch rig, mm -hmm. and that's why catches and yaws got to be very popular in yachting. Yeah. You could handle them with fewer men, the sails weren't so big, and it never 
There were at that period there were a lot of yachts that were schooner built, you know, yeah. like big schooners like this. Um, John Barrymore had the Mariner, yeah, which was it looked just like a Gloucester fishing schooner. In fact, they used it in the movie Captain's Courageous. Yeah. It was built in Essex by the same guys that built the, the T boat, and uh, he won the. the uh, I forgot what race it was across the, the Hawaiian race. They raced. In, Trans-Pacific or whatever they yeah, call it. Yeah, Trans-Pacific race, and he won it with a Mariner. Yeah. But pretty soon, uh, at that time too, the uh, the um, J boats were in the American Cup races. They were they had those big the Ranger and the Endeavor. They were gigantic rigs. It was before they had any restrictions on the size of the rig. I don't know if you know much about yachting, but well, actually, somewhat, yeah. They cut all that out because it got so expensive the only millionaires could compete. When they had to have big crews. And, and they the, had the, yeah. big, the rainbow, you remember yeah. the rainbow? remember reading about it, yeah. They were very large. Tremendously. Yeah, big things. boats. Beautiful things. And nobody, they never had built yachts that could sail that fast. I yeah. would imagine that in designing the, the fishing schooners that they, they would realize that the tonnage that they would have on board plus the motive power or the sails that they'd have to, the effort that would have to be generated by the sails and they just made the sails big enough to push that thing through the water as fast as they could. That could be safely done. Almost, I mean they... Yeah, there's a, I'm not a designer. Formulas, I guess, for all so of that. You've got to know how, you can't over, over rig it or over... Uh, right. What are they called? Over well, spar over do whatever, you know, too big a sail for the size yeah, of the hull. Yeah, they just overpower the vessel yeah. and roll it over. But they, of course, when they, another thing is that they load those things down with salt and then fish. And they were way down the water and there, you know, a lot of ballast on them. Yeah. Take a lot to they'd roll them over. Yeah. They would go down though, wouldn't they? Did yeah. some of them go roll over? There was, yeah, there was one that rolled over completely and came right back up. Made a 360 degree roll. <laughs> really? With the sails on it? Went under? No, it just masted it, of course. Oh, it just, yeah. But it did roll up. <coughs> I forgot. I got the. My memory so bad. I got stories of it in there in that yeah. book, where the there's a burn was a burn spot in the ceiling where the stove lid hit the hit, hit the, the cabin overhead, roof. Yeah, yeah, the cabin roof and burnt a hole in the roof. Oh. And it came right back up. And uh, oh god, they, they, they did it lose the way down. a lot of men or no? You shook a lot of them were out fishing probably. Yeah. Yeah. No, a lot of weather like that, but. Oh, there's a... What was the, the, the time, the actual, what would you say, I know you had a painting of the, that went to the museum, uh, the Peabody, of the first steam trawler. Yeah. yeah. Okay, what was that, 1910? See, 1905, I think the spray was built. But, that okay. was the first steam trawler. When do you figure the, the real kind of end of these active as oh. sailing fishing boats came? Well, in the 20s, they started to put power in most of them, but they still carried sail, and they used the engines as auxiliaries, and uh, uh, when there was a lack of wind and for coming in and out of port. But uh, they kept sail on them. Uh, it didn't all of a sudden stop. They, they started reducing the sail in area. Uh, but sail carried right on through uh, most of the late 20s. Yeah. Uh, they didn't build many from then on. When was the last hull built known that, I mean, that you know of that was constructed and launched? What date? How late? Well, they, they never stopped. They just, they started building, altered the design. The Tebow probably was the last, uh, maybe the, I have to check on the Mayflower. It was maybe launched after the Tebow. Yeah, as a pure sailing fishing well, well, boat. Pure sail. The Tebow had an engine in it too. Did it? They, yeah. Uh, the last all all sail. sail one launched would be. I'd have to check, but probably in the early twenties. Yeah. Maybe not quite that late. They used to take old vessels and put power in them. Yeah, as as gasoline engines and yeah, they started uh, out with gasoline engines. Yeah. Yeah. Then they switched to diesel engines because later yeah. now everything's popular. I would imagine too that some of them even got uh, 
engines put in them with just sail would be for an emergency use only, probably. With they'd shorten the mast, wouldn't oh, they? Oh, cut the mast ugly down, cut the bowsprit off. Yeah, they use the sail as a steady yeah. device. Or if they had, then they didn't even carry a boom on the main. Yeah. They, this boom was entirely gone. They just had a, a riding sail, a trysail in here. Yeah, to keep the foresail the way it is. But they depended upon power. Until they got to the point where they started doing what they called dragging. And instead of going out and fishing in dories, they dragged nets across the bottom of the ocean to catch fish that way. Now all fish are caught that way. The hand, well, the, the dory hand fishing. Line, was hand line fishing, wasn't it? Hand line. Well, there were two ways. The dory, the Gloucester was very unique in dory fishing. They, they, they had dory trawling or dory hand lining. Trawling, they set a long trawl with a lot of hooks. Or hand lining is what it says. He's saying, throw a line over the side and catch fish that way. But that all changed when the, the steam trawlers came in. And the British were way ahead of the Americans, anyhow. They were dragging them, tra trawling long before the United States was. And it turned out that that was the most popular way and the safer way to go fishing. Didn't have to go out in those small boats all the time. Well, it was more probably. So the Kirtry El Tebow was hand -led, was dory trawling up into 30. 39 even. Yeah, that's pretty long. Yeah. Yeah, it's a long. She was cut down, but she's still, the guys went out in dories and set their trawlers. I would imagine they were making money. I guess the next logical question, Tom, would be, uh, how do you, what uh, what do you do to uh, get an idea for a painting? Because there's so many, you know, ways you could do this. Uh, what do you, how do you well, use your thought pr process start? Well, for instance, uh, this guy that wrote the book Fast and Able, Gordon Thomas, is a friend of mine. And his father was a skipper, one of the top skippers out of Gloucester. And uh, he was skipper of the uh, schooner Sylvania. And in 1918, the, the Germans were over off the East Coast and they were raiding the fishing industry mm -hmm. with submarines and sinking the vessels. And. Uh, they boarded his ship, the, the Sylvania. Actually, what the Germans did was they captured a, a Canadian steam trawler and disguised themselves as Canadian fishermen. And then they would approach American vessels and uh, uh, as though they were, because the Americans were fishing in Canadian waters, and they would uh, they would approach the Canadian the vessels and pretend to be Canadian officials checking their papers and all. Yeah. Well, then they they called, uh, they, they they hailed the Sylvania and they called Jeff Thomas over and he showed them his papers and all and they just, they... Showed him? No, they didn't. They, they, they told him that uh, they went back aboard the, the vessel, the ship, the fishing schooner, and they planted time bombs. And, on, the, uh, on the schooner? On the schooner. And this is what they used to do with a lot of them. And they said, you got, I think it was eight minutes they gave them to get all the dories over. And everybody started rowing. Oh, that's terrible. And then they would sink the, sink uh, the ship. Well placed yeah. time bomb. It yeah. wasn't very expensive. Yeah. You'd blow the bottom out, and it went down in about four or five minutes. And, uh, and everybody was out in their dories. The submarine they... was sitting off on the horizon. And Gordon always wanted me to paint a picture of that because it was his father's vessel. Yeah. So I was sitting around. Oh, last night with a sketch pad and trying to figure out a way to to make a painting that would be an interesting not only but not just as an illustration but that would stand by itself as a painting to somebody who didn't know the story or wasn't interested in it and uh, you run into a problem should be doing an illustration or are you making a painting well yeah and I don't want to make just an illustration like it was for a Saturday Evening Post article so I I fiddled around for maybe a couple of hours making sketches from different angles and. I never did find out. I made what might look like a good illustration, but I don't know that it had enough value to to stand alone as a painting. Beside, aside from the story angle. Well, you're. It's a, the, there's a there's a conflict there of the story, or is it a, a wall decoration? And it might be a good storytelling piece, but it might not look good hanging on somebody's wall. And I, after all, I got to sell paintings. Would well, you? I could sell it to Gordon Thomas because he had right. a special interest. But. Would you think, though, that what you do uh, has a certain uh, 
uh, let's say, documentary value to it. Maybe that's not the sure, right some word. Some paintings, some yeah. paintings have a lot more than others. This painting is, this is just a wall hanger. Right. There's no story to it, and it's just a pretty picture. But you are, you're very accurate in the way that you paint the, 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 uh, the subject matter, because just as we were talking a minute ago before we started the, the tape again, uh, you could take the impressionistic school of painting, which is less considered, uh, less uh, concerned with the content. They could paint most any kind of subject matter, and that they dealt with just color and, and light and prettiness or whatever, whatever suited their fancy. The artist painted it almost for himself. Uh, right. You paint these for yourself because you have a, a great interest in them, but. I think they, that uh, they're still accurately drawn because of the subject matter. If you didn't treat it that way, I, you know, I would think you'd be slighting it, would, don't you? It leave something, for me, it would leave something to be desired. I, I think it should have all the other qualities that maybe the impressions have, but still be accurate. Right. So uh, that gets to be a problem. But your your skies. I mean, the, the the way you paint the skies and the and the, the surrounding elements that complement the boat. Are, could be as impressionistic as anybody would think. Right. Really. Right. I mean, it's not. However, when I paint the water, though, I want to paint the water so that I feel like I'm right there in the water, and that it looks like water looks to me. Those impressionist paintings that I see of water, and a lot of the great marine painters that are considered great, it doesn't look like real water to me. Ryder was. I don't hear see Ryder. Well, yeah, I've seen it. Who's the other American uh, marine painter that used to do seascapes? Well, uh, well, no, no, not Homer, but uh, he did Constable. Shoreline. Well, that was British. He's British. Who was that? Uh, shorelines. Well, sure, like the East Frederick Coast. Frederick Waugh. You mean? Frederick Waugh. Yeah, he painted realistic. Like His water. water had a beautiful feel to right. it. Right. Uh, I, I get a certain feeling out of, from water, but to get that feeling, it's got to look like. The real thing to well, me. you you study the form of it, and water has a form, yeah, a very distinct oh, yeah. form. It's a regular form of it. And it, um, I would say, I would think it's very bit. difficult to paint water. That's that what it, everybody says. Well, it is. But I've been I've been practicing since I was a kid in high school. I used to sit up really? in my bedroom and with oil paints and do, draw water. Just paint, paint with, water. Yeah, I got used to have a lot of paintings like that. I got them upstairs. Did you did you make did you? Uh, I'd like to see never, them sometime. Never could um, come off of what I liked, but I yeah. never show you any of those. Upstairs. You never showed me any of them. I no, got I, stuff I did in high school. Well, next on the next uh, when we get back to this tape roll, we'll add that on to it. Uh, I got the first fishing schooner I ever painted after I saw that came home from that movie. I good Captain's Courageous. Yeah, yeah, it was done in colored pencil. And, but it was, uh, it, I just never could get satisfied. It's only been in the last few years I started to be a little more. Satisfied with the way the water looked, just struggle and struggle. Well, you have a you, the uh, and to my observation of the way that you handle the water, uh, it's it's simple in nature, but yet there's enough complexity to it because you've got the planes of the water worked out, and yet the movement of the water is there, and the foam and the way the spray. Uh, you know, try to try to organize it into areas that, and as you say, plains. That's really much like painting mountains. You know, breaking it down into plains at different angles to the sky, reflect at different values and uh, color. And try to simplify it so it gives you a feeling of space and, and form, rather than just a lot of fancy brush strokes. Yeah, I'm looking at this water uh, close now. And uh, there's a, how would you, just out of curiosity, how would you like structure the water? The, the, the swells are there, which you have to keep in mind, but then there's the intermediate yeah, movement yeah. that comes in between the, the peaks, the big, the big, the big swells. Can you, on, the, on that one there, can you sort of point out the... Well, yeah, the most obvious area, of course. The value change from here, which down to say here, is a grad gradation, but in, but in between there are all these different subtle changes in, in planes. Right. But as you get nearer and nearer the the vertical, those subtle variations can't be any 
can't overpower the ones down here. Right. So that you, within that value range, your your value can't jump out of here and be as light as it is down here. It's still it's got to be lighter in the dark, but still darker than this. So it stays within a gradation. Right. Well, it's almost the old rule of like nothing in the dark can be as as light as the darkest in the light. Right. And it's uh, so that you don't confuse the light planes with the dark planes. Is that a you matter mean? first of, I've been fiddling around lately and try to, without getting all the intermediate. Right, changes. which is what confuses a lot of water paint. Paint is just as though they were just gradual s slopes, not broken up with all the subtle uh, secondary changes in, in planes, but just the big planes. Then when you get that all that value established, go back in and try to break it up a little more. Uh, the but I try to get a big pattern first. Yeah, which keeps you from getting gets getting it confu confusing. Kind of helps the composition. Right. I make a, a value sketch in black and white and try to get a big shape. Of what you, well, like this little sketch here, you know. All right. Yeah. I thought a, a shape right in here like that. Yeah, I can see it. Offset yeah. by a dark down here. Your shoulder's a little in the way there. Yeah. Okay. With a, with this long. Right. Dark here. Right. Which helps set off the foam. Right. And the and the vessel. Then keeping that general dark value in mind, get it into here and. Well, you make a pattern sketch like that on, on, on everything that you do. Yeah. And uh, I know out. you've done that for ever. <laughs> you've always done yeah. that, whether it was no matter what you were I painting. I think that uh, otherwise it, you just get, and that's what photographs don't do. You look at that photograph. And right. It just starts to get this to be a, a, a full gradation. But if you look real hard, you find that there is a certain shape in here. Right. That you got to sort of. Well, you have out. to. It, in other words, it boils right down to you've got to really study the water, very carefully, and observe what it's doing. To to find those shapes. Yeah. Big and, shapes. And it isn't in all pictures yeah. that you take. And so you have to sort of emphasize the positive, pick the good things, and build on those, and forget the negatives. Uh, I've seen so much water that has had little, like little peaks, a lot of little. Well, that's it. It's, it gets busy and. Uh, and it destroys the whole painting. I, I try to get a feeling of big masses of heavy mountains moving, you know, and I don't think you get it with all this little bunchy stuff. It's, all those little things get to be too more important than the, the big pattern. The big pattern, right? And, uh, and yet your water will stand close inspection and yet not get finicky looking. Uh, yeah, of course it's... And I think that that's a key to, to keeping... Uh, if You can stand back from a painting of yours and be at a distance and it still holds... It doesn't have to... You don't have to be back away from it for it to look good. I, I don't know if that makes sense or not, but I mean, I can... You can stand across a room or you can get up within six feet of it, and it's still, you can keep moving in closer. Not that it's full of detail, but it's, it just, there's something, the, the color transitions and the transparency of the water and the, and the solidity of it and everything else, it, it looks like water. And it, I don't know, I, I, I don't want to say it's, it isn't photographic because it's carried beyond photographic, uh, uh, it's organized. Like organized. You say, where it's organized where the photograph doesn't organize. There are a few photographs that come out where it looks good. Well, those I think are just, it's kind of an accident sometimes well, too. Yeah, it's and the light and are, they're few and far between. Yeah, but uh, yeah. yeah with this, without three dimension, uh, I stand out there and board ship and I look at that water and photograph it. Man, it just looks take your breath away. It's so terrific. And you get that film back and you develop it. It looks like nothing. Yeah. Because you don't have that third dimension. It just flattens right out, and you, so you got to sort of emphasize a change in, in planes, the light side to the dark side, so that it, you can really see it with one dimension, and not depend on that third dimension effect. The color temperature, uh, the temperature changes from a warmer. That's right. Yeah, do it with color temperature and with light right. and dark. Yeah. So that one will recede. Of course, it will always reflect parts of the. Will always reflect the sky. Well, at all. It it always. At it's all. A, if it were perfectly Unless still, it would be a, direct into it. Yeah. If it were a flat, if there were no waves, no swell, anything, it would be a mirror, and it would look. It, it would, would reflect perfectly the sky. flat. It would just reflect the sky.
But as the, as the wave turns up, then you look more and more into the wave, and right. not, and then I, like I put a little blue up here, and I I'm pick it up the, over. Yeah, I pick all the the water that's reflecting that area will be a, that color blue. The water, the waves that are reflecting this area will be grayer. That helps to give sides to things. It's just like painting it. Well, a, painting anything, a an object, a, yeah, yeah, any, a round or a, uh, something that is reflected. Yeah, you take a, a block and set it up the classical experiment, you know, right. the light, the dark, and right. the different colors. And if you can try to simplify the whole thing down to that concept, I mean, that's not so easy to do. And well, then invent devices to do that, you know. You have to make sure, too, that the area that you reflect, like that cool blue that's up in the upper left corner, or the cerulean-looking blue, it has to be, or and then where the warmer white of the clouds are, has to be in the right place, so that that's right, yeah. it comes back like a cue ball. I mean, it's the same angle of, yeah. of reflection, almost, that you're looking at it, so that you don't... That also gives you another tool to work with, as well, far you as invent, You have little tricks, of that you, things that you do to help you. The lighting, I mean, yeah. if you take that light and instead of lighting it back lighting, put the sun out here, it flattens the water out tremendously. Right. You don't get to... Well, backlighting is probably It's always, flat, the best. backs or yeah. side always yeah. gives more shape to things. Yeah. Front lighting is, is pretty tough. Do you, uh, this is a little off subject, do you invent the sail patches that are on the sails? Do you sort of just put them on there? Oh, where you, or do you have points where I've there might been, be chafing points, or well, they, yeah, they always, they always. I just happened to notice patches, those. Well, I haven't painted all the detail on it. Right. There are reef points along here. There are two lines of reef points. Right. And they, those are the wear. So the patching usually comes along the, the the reef points. So that you could legitimately, when you put something like that in the painting. Well, that's the way they would be. You're basing it on some. Uh, oh yeah. Honest. Uh, from old photographs I see, but that's where the patches always are. Yeah. There's also a, this topping that comes down here, it's always riding against the Oh, it chafes against it, yeah. And so, in fact, this, this thickness here, and I haven't painted all that in yet, it's a thickness they call baggy wrinkle, or yeah. chafing gear. Yeah. And it's a fuzzy type of stuff that... Oh, yeah, I've seen that. They yeah, wrap that around the line so it doesn't wear. But then they usually, a lot of times, there'd be a patch right across the sail here where that thing is constantly rubbing. It wears sails. The sails wear out in about three years, anyhow. So you, if they're brand new, they don't have any patches in them, but I think patches help make it look like a working vessel rather than a yacht. Well, it gives it character. You see some of that chafing gear on... on. Okay, in formulating your, your uh, research or gathering materials for research, I know you uh, have collected a, a tremendous amount of photography, old photographs. Why don't you tell us a little bit about it, in addition to these uh, museum quality, very fine models that you have here, I, uh, as we take a little look at them. Uh, so why don't you tell us about how you use this and in conjunction with the other research that you do? Well, <clears throat> I've always been interested in, uh, don't love sh ship models of when I was pretty young. and. Uh, uh, I built a model of the Elsie about 1950, spent a lot of time on it. I still have it. It's not in this room, it's in the other room. And uh, then I, when Howard Chappelle came out with his book on American fishing schooners, uh, it was a, it's a Bible on the subject. Uh, it had so much more information that nobody, that wasn't available to people. It never put down in a book form. And that book came out, I forgot, it was about 1972 or something. And I got so enthusiastic about all the, the so much information and detail, and I decided to build this model. All right, that's the, the uh, Thomas Cromwell. Uh, and I was working on the hull, and of course that's very slow work. And I began to re realize that uh, I'd be better off making paintings and spending my time doing the paintings, even though I like to do the models. So I had a, a fellow in Rockport, Massachusetts, who's a professional model builder, Eric Ronberg, probably the best, one of the best model builders in the country. And I sent the, what I had built the whole hull and some of the deck fittings, and I sent it to him and uh, sent photographs to him, and then he evaluated the photographs to see that it was worth his spending time on, and then he 
took on the project of finishing it. So he put the mast in and rigged it and finished off all the deck details and all that. Uh, because my time was better spent, I'd rather spend a painting. And uh, All right, this vessel we're looking at, go ahead, Tom, is the... Uh... Well, this one was the second one we wanted to build because it was a classic vessel, the Harry Belden. Uh, it was sort of a, it was a milestone. It's a entirely different type of vessel than the other one, and it represented a type that uh, many others were built after. And so he started this one from scratch and built it all himself. Um, it's incredible detail on this. Oh, everything. everything I'm looking works. at the anchor. Uh, the windlass. Yeah. The windlass. No, no, right up here where it's over, outboard where it's uh, right into in here. Oh yeah. And uh, it's incredibly uh, detailed. Well, I, I find that the the models give me a chance to be a little more creative in what I'm doing because I can use these models like I, you would a, a, a human model in a studio. You, you can come up with all kinds of angles that you couldn't imagine. And uh, I draw from the models, photograph them, and uh, they are typical of large classes of vessels. And uh, many other vessels can be made from these by altering the basic prototype. And through the research that I do from I know where the changes should be made to, and I find that they're a great asset. I set them up and uh, can compose different angles that I wouldn't get if I didn't have the models. Uh, we're looking close up at the dory here. Go ahead and let's uh, hear some of the... the uh... Well, these dories are they're, they're small boats that are carried aboard the large vessel that they use, and they're stacked up here. Uh, the, 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 what they call nesting to conserve space obviously but they use these dories to go over the side and do the actual fishing now there were many different sized dories used these happen to be halibut dories uh, halibut is probably the largest type of fish they catch and they require large dories and heavier dories so these are about 20 foot dories okay uh, we see that they're nested Correct? Right. And I've got these. These are actually, there's two different types of dory. This this one is a, uh, a haddock dory. It's a little smaller than the than this one, which is a halibut dory. Set it down on the uh, top of the, uh, of your, uh, of there, and then I can see it a little better. Yeah. How long was that one again? These are... About 18 feet. The halibut dories are about 20 feet. Yeah. And these are heavier construction than these. Yeah. Because they're heavier fish and uh, and these are for two men to a dory. Right. There are also dories built that are smaller, that are 14 feet, which are single man dories <clears throat> for a single dory hand lining and some trawling. Uh, there's with one man in the dory, they don't need to be so big. When they have one man on a dory, they usually carry more of them. They'll carry maybe up to 20 dories on, on board, and the nest will be much higher. Uh, what is the other boat right there? The uh... This is a seine boat. This is a whole different type of fishing, where they put out a large seine net and encircle a school of fish, and then they purse the top of the seine together and trap the fish within the seine, bring them alongside the vessel, and scoop them out of the seine net up onto the deck. And this, this is the, it's very much like a whale boat. The crew gets in this seine boat, rows out with the aid of a single dory, which will be like this. One man in the dory, 12 men in the seine boat. The seine boat goes out, spreads the net out. The man in the dory takes one end of the net, brings it around, back to the seine boat and makes the purse or makes, makes, the, makes the, loop. The, the loop and at that point they purse the seine all the men pull in the seine and get the fish up into a small area next to the vessel and at that point they scoop with dip nets uh, 
the fish out of the seine up onto the deck. They do it over on this other side. There's a seine rover here. Now this vessel right now is rigged out for two different types of fishing. It, I put all the junk I have on. This, for seining, this gurry box wouldn't be here. There would be a large net laying on the deck here. They wouldn't have the dories on board because they don't use dories for seining. For seining. This seine boat is carried when they're underway on board deck. I see. But uh, when they're going to and from the grounds, once they get to the grounds, they... They tow it. They, they tow it. Yeah. She's a long aft. Because she's about 40 feet long. And... Uh, that's a pretty heavy boat then, 40 footer. Oh, to... that's a heavy boat. It's 40 feet long and it, uh, it's a big job to get it on, on and off the deck. I'm amazed that the details on this uh, model are just exquisite. They're Everything works too, doesn't it? Looks it? like yeah, all the, the little nuts unscrew and uh, all of the the uh, the rings around the the booms and the spars. Uh, these are all you can take all these little nuts off and take those take it all apart. They're all threaded. All the hatch covers come off and open up. Incredible. Can, so you can really use these models as a basis for uh, for all kinds of almost any configuration and. Right. Uh, you can take this off, and this has, I have hatch covers that go on in place of this companionway here. So you can, you can convert it to... This uh, would be for halibut fishing, and the, you have a regular hatch cover like this one would go on there for, uh, for macro fishing. Well, in dealing in the kind of painting that, paintings that you're doing, and the uh, quality of work, and what is expected of, of the painting, this authenticity is uh, very important. Um, from an aspect of uh, where did you get the copy that you, you know, what did right. you work from, and people would, I would imagine people would question, you know, and want to know if they're truly uh, into, uh, you know, this collecting the paintings or, or whatever. Is that, is that true? Have you had uh, people... Well, uh, some people don't know, don't know anything about the subject and they wouldn't know whether it was correct or not correct, but there are some people around who do. And uh, a very few, but uh, I think that to some of well, the credibility uh, wears off on people, even <laughs> unsuspecting ones. Well, you mean that they they accept accept what you have done? Well, as uh, they do, yeah. Uh, but whether they did or not, I know it's correct. And, uh, yeah. Well, I think that's the main the main uh, thing I think you have to concern I'm not, yourself I'm with. I'm doing this partly for my own enjoyment, not just to... to as a commercial venture, I think. Yeah, yeah, not yeah. just as a commercial venture.